around the world. This was our, Singapore is the first chapter for Asia. In Singapore, we've got about 3,000 members from a variety of backgrounds. Now, she says globally is focused on creative, digital advertising, communications, and marketing. But because of the fact that the future of work is very different in Singapore, we're seeing a blend. So we are starting to have women coming from technology. We had a couple of data scientists at our last event. We have a couple of teachers in the room. We've got lawyers. We've got people from a variety of backgrounds, and we're always open to more industries. At the end of the day, she, said, uh, she says goal is really simple. We want to see more women at the top. Um, Vicky, you pulled up an interesting stat, right, for IWD, about how much women are getting paid in Singapore for every dollar. Uh, it's about 0 0.75. So we make 75%. Yeah. yeah. So we want to actually see that go up and for it to be equal, considering we do a lot more stuff in general. So um, to kick things off, I'll let Vicky introduce herself. Um, hi, guys. I'm Vicky, uh, so co-founder of She Says Singapore. We've been running this for about six years now. And actually, we're now closer to 4,000 members. Okay. Yeah. And I'm um, really glad to have new people and new faces here. Um, definitely say hi to our welcome committee and our She Says Girls there in the yellow tag. Um, so myself, um, I run my own AI startup, but I'm also the, co -found, uh, the founder of Singapore and Southeast Asia's largest independent animation festival. So if you like cartoons, definitely reach out to me. Um, I also run, um, am part of a programmatic agency, so if you're looking for or, uh, digital marketing um, advice or anything like that, please reach out to me. Um, I'm Mira. I'm also one of the co-founders for She Says. Um, during my day job, I work in digital and innovation at Accenture. I focus on cities and transportation. Um, I'm obsessed with my day job, um, but I'm also, uh, I also founded a photography company last year, which focuses on street photography in Asia. So I do both of those things, I quite enjoy it, and we're quite lucky in Singapore that we have the ability to tap into communities like she says, to be able to help grow our business, um, to help grow ourselves. I think last year, or the year before, I think we had five businesses grow from she says, yeah. from new partnerships and new friendships found, um, and new passions as well. So now she says is not complete, without the volunteers and the people that you have working behind the scenes. So you've got July, who's at the back over there, and she's been uh, quietly serving you your drinks, but she's also one of our creative people. So she's putting together all the creative content. We've got Eleni, um, who is our PR, media, and comms person. We've got Sam, who's right there, mm -hmm. um, who pretty much runs our jobs pairing program. So if you are looking for a role, or if you're a recruiter and you're looking to meet um, more uh, potential new candidates. Sam's your girl, um, so go and have a chat with her. Um, we've got Alicia who is um, at the back and she's our creative lead and she built together our recently launched website um, and she manages all of our content. Virginie and Sarah. So Virginie is our new program director for Who's Your Mama and she's right there. Um, Virginie is kind of like the parent in, in this little um, group. Um, she also is one of the leads at Hyper Island. So when it comes to any of the mentorship questions, or if you want to be a mentee, go and speak with Virginie. Um, she has got the email under control. We know that you've been sending emails. We apologize for not being able to get back to you, but Virginie is someone you can talk to. And Sarah is up okay. on the staircase, obviously, um, and she is one of our partner leads. So moving on. Yeah, so this event wouldn't have been possible without some of our great um, and partners that we actually have on board and one of them is Jesco. So they have actually provided this amazing uh, venue for us and Jesco is an amazing co-working space with I think about three or four floors um, in this building. Um, so if you're interested to rent a space or to understand Jesco's business a bit more, feel free to reach out to the staff that's at the front desk. So the topic for today. Now um, it's I know that um, a lot of people are wanting to try and get tickets, and this is definitely one of those sessions that we wanted to kick off. So just to start, who here had these like ridiculous goals of, I'm not going to drink this January. I'm going to be super healthy and go to the gym every day. Yeah? Yeah, I totally did as well. Um, well, January is like that year where you want to try and kick off everything, and you want to dominate everything. You've got all your goals, and you've got the conversations going yeah. with your boss about what you want to do and how you want to nail life. 
but it's also about making things scalable. Beyond January, what can you be doing next to get things going? Now, before we actually get into the panel and our speakers, who I'm go we're going to introduce to you shortly, I'm going to throw out some stats which came from a Fitbit study um, on Singapore. 35 and 43. So what do you think the 35 means? By any chance, I'm just like, I'm going to do this. 35 hours? So, okay, so actually, there were, was it 43 countries? 46 countries. Out of 46 countries that were studied, Singapore came in 35th in terms of sleep, active minutes, and steps. So we don't sleep enough, which we already know that. But considering we have the number of gyms and access that we have and the amount of parks, we're not making use of them. And 43 is the number of sleeps. And so we're the third worst country, and who are the worst? Uh, India. India and Pakistan? In, sorry, 47, India, Pakistan, Malaysia. Okay, so Malaysia's the worst. <laughs> um, so, but India, Pakistan, Malaysia, and the Philippines. So, come on, people, like, you've got beds, you've got good homes. Now, the more, now this study actually came from Singapore. One in seven people, and you have more than seven friends, have, has experienced a mental disorder of some kind, and a lot of people don't talk about it, um, and one in nine are diabetic. Now, chronic illnesses are actually growing in Singapore, um, and what we want to talk about today is how can we mitigate that? How can you help other people who are in your communities uh, be able to better address this topic? So I'm gonna invite our speakers up onto these recently harnessed chairs. So we've got John from Fitbit, Wendy from UFIT, Luciano from F45, and Natalie from Natty Lift. So if everyone can give us a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to kick off with John. So we'll start off with um, the panel with going through a few questions and then after that we're going to open it to the floor where you'll be able to answer ask any questions that you might have so just to kick things off hello and um, maybe if you could quickly introduce yourself what do you do and what does wellness mean to you uh, so my name is John Gilman I'm the director of health solutions for Fitbit based here in Singapore I'm Australian and I just want to say I've, I've had a, um, already today a difficult audience I, I was having a conversation with my daughter who lives in Melbourne and was telling her that I was speaking at a women's forum tonight and there was silence and I said what's wrong and she said why is a man speaking at a woman's forum <laughs> so just be nice to me okay I've had a tough time um, I've been in Singapore for three years um, I was in the uh, PR and partnerships role and recently moved into health solutions um, I'm a very passionate fit bidder. I'm, I'm also, a, I think, probably a, a good person to talk about work-life balance. I got out, uh, like uh, most expats, I got out my um, boarding passes that I've collected in the last three years, and I'm up to number 170, and I get on a plane tomorrow night. So, um, you know, work-life balance is incredibly important to me, and, you know, the, the way I use my Fitbit is, uh, you know, pretty critical to that. Hi, my name's Wendy. Um, I work for UFIT. Um, I'm from Scotland, but I've actually lived in eight countries over the last 18 years, so I'm fairly adaptable. Um, can't speak any other languages, so but I'm really great with my hands. Um, I've got four kids as well. Um, I'm 44, and I believe that you can do, as women, anything you absolutely want. Um, strength training, whatever it is, uh, nothing should hold us back, uh, families, whatever. We do need to juggle a bit more. I think we need to be more mindful of our time than men do um, but we can still do whatever we want to do I think wellness is is several things um, it's not perfect for everybody but there's different dynamics for everybody so clearly for me nutrition is important um, fitness moving um, doing something that you're passionate about when you move so that you continue to move and you don't run into a wall by the end of January um, social health as well, so getting out, having friends, having hobbies, things that, that interest you, and clearly mental health too. So it's not just, just one facet. Um, I've worked in health and fitness pretty much my whole life. I also do personal training. Some of you might know me from UFIT boot camps. I'm the one that screams the loudest. If anybody's doing the Spartan on Saturdays, anybody doing the Spartan on Saturday? 
I'm going to be one of the warmer uppers. They don't need to give me a microphone, but they will. Um, I'm also running it too, so if you see me stuck at one of the walls, do, please don't worry about touching my bum to get me over there because I'll be thanking you for it. Um, I think we should just get out there and, and be social with our fitness and that's what keeps us going and keeps us active and keeps us turning up to those uh, fitness dates with ourselves. Uh, my name's Luciano. I'm a leader within the F45 cult. That some of you may have heard of and I see a lot of familiar faces around this room. Um, I moved up to Singapore almost three years ago. Um, I was, I've got some F45s which I also uh, manage in Australia as well. Um, came up to Singapore just because uh, something new and different. I like the market. It's, a, it's very trendy and it's got a lot of young people who, uh, like I say, work hard, play hard, which I think is one of the things that we see up here that's both a benefit and a detriment to some people from a health perspective. Um, wellness to me is very much about how you feel. I mean, like Wendy said, there's multiple dimensions to what wellness is. Um, but I think overall, if you don't feel well, everything else doesn't matter. So... Um, and, and ways to achieve, you know, feeling well is either exercise, nutrition, just basically moving, or, or like when you said, being social. So, yeah. Okay. Hi. So my name is Natalie, and as Mira pointed out earlier, um, I'm on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Natty Lives, and uh, a lot of people like to just call me Natty. Um, I'm a fitness enthusiast. I am a certified boot camp coach and um, I sometime when I have some free time I work in a bank. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean whenever people look at my Instagram um, they tend to just think I'm a, either a trainer or I work in a gym uh, but I actually am very much like all of you guys out here. I work an intense uh, job in a bank. Um, I know what it's like to try and, you know, juggle, trying to be fit, trying to eat well, and at the same time, like, you know, the rest of life's commitments, whether it's your family. Um, I mean, I was asked by Mira to speak on the panel, and I looked at the rest of the, the panelists. Um, I just realized that I'm a consumer of one of their products or services. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I wear a Fitbit, so, so that's John. Uh, well, the Fitbit tells me I don't sleep enough, um, that I should maybe get a little bit more rest into my daily routine. Um, my boot camp certification is actually from UFIT, so that's Wendy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a small world. And um, well, I spend most mornings at F45, so I am one of those followers. <laughs> Yeah, um, but more importantly, I think, you know, as I mentioned, it's, I think I can relate to each and every one of you. Um, I am just like every one of you seated out there, like I'm trying to juggle a job and keeping fit. And I think um, hopefully today we can all help to try and, you know, find that balance together. Great. Wait, so, um, sorry. So when you just mentioned just now that you don't sleep very much. So how many hours are we talking about? Because I know from my Fitbit that if I sleep more than five hours and 15 minutes in a night, I don't function the following day. Are we really getting into this? <laughs> okay, so um, John would probably hate me, but I actually only get into bed around midnight. And then in order to make it for my 6 a.m. at 45 class, I, I wake up at 5.30 in the morning. So yes, there's not a lot of sleep. Um, I do try to get more sleep on the weekends, um, even though I think John would disagree with me. There, has, there have been a lot of studies that say, you know, you shouldn't, it doesn't work that way, right? Like it, it's not like you sleep less on the weekdays and therefore you make up and sleep 10 hours on the weekends. <laughs> so Wendy's sh shaking your head. Uh, yeah, you can't actually make up your sleep, so if you lose your sleep, it doesn't make any difference if you sleep 10 hours on the weekend. You can't like, uh, put it in, the, in your back pocket. Um, for women in particular, it really, really affects our hormones, um, which can lead to, to all sorts of problems with weight loss, with fitness goals, with mental health. Um, and I personally, I, I make sleep a priority. I never get less than seven hours a night, otherwise I literally cry. Um, and I also force it on my kids and they hate me because I make them have 11 hours night, sleep a night and um, I always get, but mommy, my friend gets to sleep until blah blah time, I'm like, I just really don't care, we go into your bed now, because uh, I just think it's just really, really important and we pay a lot of money to 
to go and train and come to people like myself and Luciano. Um, we do pay thousands of dollars on nutrition and fancy food, etc. And, and yet we're robbing ourselves of one of the most important things for our health and, and we can easily um, change that. I think uh, technology now, I mean, we've got our phones by our beds, it pings, we check that message, it can just wait till the morning really to be, to be fair and I think sleep's super important. You, you can't bag it for a rainy day. I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to say, um, we, we did the, the, the data that Mira showed before, we've updated that for 2018. So Singapore has improved slightly, now number 39 out of 46 countries. Um, Singaporeans sleep on average 5 hours and 50 minutes a night, and, and we know that. We have um, 140,000 people with a Fitbit in Singapore, and, and a large number of these people would have a heart rate device that is tracking sleep. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing is we did a comparative study between uh, with Duke NUS between um, people in Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Australia and New Zealand. And on average, people in Australia and New Zealand sleep an extra hour a night. Um, and and the, the interesting thing for me, I was in Australia over Christmas, and the, the one thing that I really noticed the difference between Singapore and being in Melbourne for a month are the addiction to screens. You know, that people here are on their phones all the time. You get on trains and see it. And the researchers at Duke determined that the reason that sleep um, duration was lower in Singapore, and this was based on um, their research, was a lot to do with the fact that people here get into bed and are still on their phones. So people don't put their phones down. And I think, you know, I think screen time is, is a huge issue here. And it, it's an issue that is getting worse and worse. And, and just with um, sleep, there's been a real... Um, there's been a, a sort of a shift away from, you know, looking at sort of some of the root causes for, uh, you, know, um, you know, diseases like diabetes. You know, we focus on activity and we focus on nutrition. But, you know, lack of sleep or poor sleep quality is, is a significant contributing factor to a lot of chronic conditions. And, and people are not necessarily aware of the role that, you know, having a good sleep plays in your, you know, your daily balance. You know, for me... With my Fitbit, my sleep is the most critical thing to me. It's the first thing I check in the morning. Uh, you know, I look at how well I've slept. I look at my average against other people. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you want to get your life in balance, sleep is the most critical thing. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sleep quality, not necessarily duration. You know, you need to focus on both. So I'll turn it over to Wendy. Um, when it comes to women, yeah. What are most women coming to, and, I, and then after I would love to know um, Lucia's and Nat's perspective, when it comes to a lot of the women who are coming to you and asking you for advice when it comes to balance, to exercise, and to nutrition and wellness, what are the key issues that come up, and what are some of the solutions that you, like, you know, there's always like a top three, right, that you would recommend to them? Yeah. Um, with most women, I find it's time. So they prioritize time for their families, for their work, for their husbands, for their kids. But they don't prioritize time for themselves. Um, particularly after having children, even if you don't, but particularly after having children, time tends to become non-existent and everybody else's priorities become more important than, than your own. And at the end of the day, you can't give your best if you don't feel your best. So taking a time, like an hour out of each day to go and work out or meditate or do yoga or whatever your thing is, Zumba, whatever it is, um, to make yourself feel better and, ju and just to reset will make you a much more productive human being in all the other areas of your life. And I always get the, I just don't have time, I can't fit it in. And it's like, you just have to make that time. Um, it's never going to be available to you if you don't prioritise yourself and it's not selfish to say to your kids mummy needs to go to CrossFit because um, mummy just really needs to go to CrossFit uh, <laughs> because you come back and you're happier and you, you read their story and you put them to bed in, in, in whatever um, I think also women are generally so busy they're not really focusing on their sleep um, so that affects our hormones much more drastically than it affects men's hormones which also affects our mental health as well whether we actually realize it or not um, anxiety and depression is um, quite prevalent when we're not eating well we're not outside we're not exercising and we're we're not sleeping properly um, so that's the things that I see mostly with women and, it, and it's a lot harder to get through to women as well that it's okay to take that time for yourself when you say to a male client okay you need an hour a day to work out and you need to do this they find it much more easier to do women have always got much more guilt about these these sort of things let's see did I answer your question yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, following on from what Wendy just said, men are a heap more selfish. So, no, we are. And so, like, when, when we want something, we're just, oh, God, I've got to watch what I say. Just we, we, we just, we, 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 we don't, we don't, we're not very empathetic. We don't really think about how it's going to affect others. Um, quite often, we get, we get women from almost all walks of life, um, a lot of mums and things like that, but then people are really focused on their careers, they're really focused on their, you know, their social group, you know, Singapore being a place where there is a lot of transient people, you know, some, sometimes new people move to town and people want to bring them on board and, you know, involve them in things and people spend a lot of time thinking about other people. So what I find happens is people in, women, end up spreading themselves too thin and as a result they don't focus enough on, on all the aspects, you know, whether it's movement, nutrition, just meditation, or they kind of try and do everything with 80 and try and fit too much in when they should really be sort of taking a more concentrated look at the things that actually are really helping or making them feel good or making them healthier and then focusing more on that. So I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a tendency to, to sort of give too much to too many and not focus enough on themselves is the root cause of a lot of the issues we see. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so, you know, I think everyone, when we start like our new year, and especially for me, like Mira's really in her F45, in her fitness. I started getting a bit into it like in August with like Wee Bar. Um, and, you know, I found something that I quite liked. But I think that a lot of us, or at least myself, what I struggle with is like, how do you even start? And how do you really um, find that time and make that time for yourself? And what's your advice for, for people or all of us, where we're trying to create our own New Year resolutions, and how do we actually make that sustainable? <laughs> um, okay, well, so uh, with regard to that question, um, I, when I talk to a lot of women, or even my colleagues in the office, um, one of the key issues that often come up is, I don't have enough time to work out. And we all have 24 hours in a day, um, maybe some slightly more than others because we sleep less. Uh, <laughs> but I think when I first started working, I did realize that I didn't have enough time to work out. Like, I mean, subjectively not enough time because if you're working a nine to five job or a nine to seven PM job, by the time you leave the office, it's close to eight, you are tired, you don't have enough energy to go to the gym. And then you think about, oh, if I go to the gym now, I would end up only going home at 11 and I still have to grab dinner and then the whole cycle repeats because you're constantly tired and it's, it's just not sustainable. Um, and then I discovered F45. Uh, it helps me get up in the morning. It's only 45 minutes. I mean, so it's, I feel like it's some time that I have to myself before work starts because when I mean, you go to the office, your start time for work is always fixed. It, it, if it could be 8.30, it could be 9, and maybe some traders may start working at 7. I mean, there, there are people who come to F45 for the 6 a.m. class because they have to be in the office by 7 a.m. in the morning. So it's still possible. It's more of what you prioritize as like important to you. So if you, know, you prioritize wellness and your own personal health and fitness, um, you will find time to, you know, to go to the gym, um, to eat well. And on the topic of eating, a lot of women often also say like, oh, like, um, I don't have enough time for lunch because I only have, say, one hour. If I want to go to the gym over lunch, um, I don't have enough time to buy something healthy. Uh, you know, all these excu excuses, I think. Um, because I think if you don't make it intentional to say, I'm going to eat healthy, I'm going to buy a salad, um, I... And you would end up eating something unhealthy later on in the day. Like if you're hungry uh, and you walk past uh, muffins, like a shop selling muffins, you know, you're going to pick up that muffin. If you walk past a shop selling cupcakes, come on, like, let's face it, you're not going to be able to resist that cupcake in the window because you're like, I'm so hungry, I just need something right now, right? So a lot of us um, just take the easy way out. Like if you, if you don't place a priority on like your health or your fitness and your n nutrition, then it's a lot harder to carry it through like to do for the rest of the year. Yeah. So going back to food, um, I think one of the most common things, so I'm a huge fan of going to a hawker center for lunch. I like my yong tau fu, I like my fish soup. I don't like salads at lunch because they're cold and I don't like cold food at lunch. Um, now the misconception that I'm so 
oh, sorry about these guys. Um, the misconception that a lot of people have, I guess, is eat, to eat healthy in Singapore requires a lot of money and it's expensive. You've got programs like, um, you know, that deliver your food for you. But I, for me personally, I refuse to spend $20 at lunch on fried beef mints with, all, with coconut oil. I just, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to spend $7 on Yong Tao Fu and just buy too much vegetable. But uh, wh what do you think when it comes to keeping healthy food options um, and, um, you know, when you look at the, lo the food that you have in Singapore, what, what is there to choose from that works? Okay, so I guess um, for most people who work in office job, like most of the time for lunch you get an hour, right? And it's a choice between do I want to hang with my friends over drinks and like good food, burgers, or do I want to go to the gym? Or perhaps I just want to pick up like a salad. And sometimes it's a toss up between would I, I want to be healthy or would I just want to like have, you know, have that burger and drown my work sorrow. <laughs> um, well, I guess for, with regard to Mira's question, um, when you go to a hawker center, there are a few items that are on the healthier side. Like, so if I do go to the hawker center, I try not to order stuff with too much oil. Um, and I think the key thing is also understanding like your macros, like understanding that if you're working out a lot, you wanna ensure that you have sufficient protein. Um, Wendy probably can elaborate a little bit more on macros. Um, but when I do go to a hawker center, I try and pick something that would be healthy. So less oil, less salt, you know, all, the, all of these things are things that you can control. You can tell the person who is making your meal, like, I don't want so much oil, and that's something I often do. Um, you can pay more for vegetables, like what Mira said, because we always need more fiber in our diet. Um, if, you know, you, you don't want to eat that many carbs at lunch, um, you might want to, say, pick up more protein instead of, like, buying um, a, fried, a plate of fried rice or fried noodles because from a macro standpoint, that's not very healthy. Yeah. I think that um, from, I mean, from what I've gathered, it's like also like pretty much like cultivating really good habits, essentially, that is sustainable. So, you know, sleeping early, eating well, choosing the right types of food, um, even when you're at the hawker. Um, I feel like that's um, quite achievable, especially for, for myself at least when I do it with friends or like communities. I mean, from each of you, do you have any communities to recommend or any, um, you know, how, how should we build this kind of social network to, to encourage each other apart from, I mean, of course, joining the gym and building friends there too. Like any other advice around that? So for me, I, I'm, you know, as I'm from Australia, I've been in Singapore for three years. I would disagree. I think it's very easy to eat healthy here at, at not, an, you know, not a high price. Like, I, I would never pay $20 for a salad for lunch, for instance. I, I think for me, it, it's about personal choice and it's about priorities and balance. And I think it's very easy to talk about balance. It's often hard to do it. But it depends what, what you want to do. What, what do you want to achieve? And, and the easiest thing is to say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go and have you know, some kind of curry from a food centre. Um, you know, it, it depends on what your personal priorities are and you know, what you want to achieve in life. Uh, you know, I, I work for Fitbit, and, and this thing here is um, you know, it's a device that tracks my activity, but it doesn't tell me what to do. It doesn't tell me to walk. It doesn't tell me how to sleep. It just tracks what I do. And, and the personal motivation for me is about self-improvement and, and you know, looking after myself uh, and getting that balance because I do travel a lot. Um, I, you know, I uh, you know, spend a lot of time um, you know, away from home or from my apartment here. Uh, you know, we talk about communities. In, in, the, in the Fitbit app, uh, there is a, a social network which is called Fitbit Feed. Um, in Singapore, roughly about half the people who have a Fitbit are interacting with each other in the, in the social network, and it's a it's a very uh, it's a great way for people to uh, you know post their Fitbit experience or their Fitbit story. The number two item in there is food. So what we see is people are looking for ways to eat more healthily, and I, th I think a lot of people genuinely don't know how to do that. You know, there's easy solutions. You can go and buy food in from somewhere. Uh, you know, I think as a company, we, we, we focus very heavily on nutrition and we focus on helping people 
uh, to achieve their personal goals. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people, like, you know, Natalie talked about macros, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who would have no idea what that means, but still want to eat healthily, um, you know, and, and it's, it's about, uh, you know, a pathway to do that. How do, how do, how do we as an organisation, how do these guys, because, you know, they're not just offering a service here, they're offering uh, a way for people to self-improve. Uh, you know, how do we do that so that people can actually find and access information that is, is meaningful? You know, it's, we watch TV shows that, you know, feature these incredible cooks that are doing amazing things. You know, most people don't eat like that. Uh, it's very easy to go to the supermarket and buy some things and make a salad at home. Uh, it, it's, about, it's about education and it's about, you know, your own personal, um, you know, desire, what you, what you want to achieve here and, and whether you're willing to actually um, to do that. Got a few things to say about this. <laughs> Sorry, please tell me to shut up if I go on for too long. Firstly, I don't really believe in New Year's resolutions. Um, nobody likes a skinny, sober woman anyway. Um, we're much better if we just be our real selves and try and be the best version of that. Um, it's all about small steps. So 1st of January, we're all going to stop drinking. We're not going to drink so much coffee. We're going to sleep more. We're going to lose weight. We're going to exercise. Oh my God, my head's exploding just thinking about it. So it's just one step at a time. So if it means that you don't have a latte on the way to work every morning, you have a black coffee instead. Um, if you make a healthy lunch choice once a week instead of every single day. If you exercise on the weekends, whether that be you go for a really long walk, a long swim, whatever that is, just make one step at a time. If you have... If you set yourself to run a marathon and you've never run before, that's a huge commitment. If you do a 5K, then you do a 10K, then you do a 15K. I have people coming to me all the time saying, I want to lose 20 kgs. And I'm like, well, it's a lot of weight, number one. So if you're setting that marker for yourself and you lose 15 kgs, what does that mean? That means you're a failure because you didn't reach that 20 kgs that you want to lose. But 15 kgs is absolutely phenomenal. It's a huge amount of weight. So do each bit step by step by step don't have these massive goals that then makes your life more difficult um, things like sleep hygiene for instance is, is is super important so i'll put my phone down at nine i'll brush my teeth at 9 30 i'll make sure i'm in my bed by 10 45 i'll read for 15 to 30 minutes and then every night i'll put the the light off at 10 15. the first few nights you'll be lay there wondering what your phone's doing with your eyes wide open you know, all sorts of stuff going through your head the third night you'll be asleep and then you'll start to feel better and then it becomes habit and you know it just becomes part of your life so it's just doing the, these small things at, at times i'm also not a big believer in counting anything whether it be macros or calories or whatever because one size doesn't fit all and there's algorithms for all these things and it doesn't necessarily fit us or our personalities or our lifestyle um, it's about making healthy choices and eating as much unprocessed foods as possible i like to call it the nana diet um, what did your nana do like 60 70 years ago she certainly wasn't eating cheerios for breakfast she wasn't having mcdonald's every other night but she managed and she didn't have a car and she didn't have this and she, you know she'd buy her food every day and prep it's not possible to make all your meals from scratch but there's so many great options now with um is uber eats still in does that still go or what is it but well, anyway grab sorry um you know so you can get these things delivered for a reasonable price also there's places like sun and moon and telecare i'm going to shout out because i get my salad from there every day seven dollars fifty and you get a big lump of chicken and you have to tell her to stop squeezing the mayonnaise on because she ain't giving up um, you know, they're, they're, you can go to cold storage, buy a whole chicken for like, what, $5.99? That would cover like two, three meals. You, you don't have to be perfect all the time. You don't have to make these goals so massive that you'll never achieve them. Don't listen to, sorry, hon, Instagram accounts so much. Because <laughs> just the heads up, 90% of it's not real. Our accounts clearly are but everything else isn't. So you need to just you know, be true to yourself and, and not make your goals other people's goals and just know that what you're doing now is enough. If you feel happy, it's enough. You don't need to do any more. Um, I think it's uh, people set, them up, set themselves up to fail from the beginning because I think when people look at nutrition, 80% of people, they frame it the wrong way. So what they look at is what they can't have. Yeah. When really you should be focusing on what you can have. And when you focus on what you can have, you should look at what should I have for performance, for longevity, for health. So if you turn, away the, turn around the way you think about foods, um, you will, when you eat it, you'll feel good. 
right? Like you won't be thinking, oh God, I'm missing out on this. You'll be like, hey, I just did that for myself. I feel really good about it. And then when you, when you turn it like that, there are heaps of real easy, like uh, low-lying fruit, taking magnesium, you take two magnesium pills, you feel like you're nailing it, right? So it's, it becomes a lot easier to justify a lot of your decisions. And then, yeah, maybe you do have to spend a little bit more money on a nicely made salad somewhere because that's just how you view food for yourself now. You view food as fuel. You don't view it as like a, you know, a break from work. It's something you eat because it's going to make your afternoon better, more productive. Um, and I think that's sort of the first step in, in making sure that you eat well. Um, something that helps supplement it is, is certainly training because if you're going to you know, make yourself go through 45 minutes of hell or something that you really find quite unappealing initially, um, you're going to be much more likely to make that healthy choice because you've just suffered for 45 minutes. So I think exercise and food really go hand in hand because they keep the other one in check. It's the same as if you eat really well, you know, you're going to want to train because you're going to be feeling good and you're going to feel like, hey, I've, got, I've, I've nutritioned myself in a certain way because I've got training this evening, so I'm going to go to training. You've had your protein shake three hours before, you've had a, a creatine shake, you've had some BCAs. Again, all low-lying fruit because you put it in a shake, you shake it and you drink it. Once you've done that, you're primed because you've done it three hours time, you know it's time to go to the gym because you've, you've done the lead up. It, it, it sort of, they, they, they support each other. Um, I think when, just, just going back to food, I think that a lot of people here have been in the situation where, I know I've done it, where I've had a massive night the night before, or I've, um, and I'm just, <laughs> sorry, but, um, so on the, the following day, I'm like, um, oh, I feel that I'm putting on weight, so I'm going to go to the gym, work out a ton, and then not eat properly. From your perspectives, I think that all of you have somehow either seen the impact of what this would do. Um, can you just kind of tell us about why it's important to always um, steadily? Um, I guess it sort of follows on to what I was saying before, like food's nutrition, it's not a break from work. It's not like 12 o'clock I should eat. Sometimes you might not feel like eating, so you just, you don't eat, right? Like if you feel like eating, you should eat. With regards to consuming food though, you should be looking to consume foods that are good for you. So if you are hungover, you know, salads and stuff are not appealing. If you do eat McDonald's for breakfast or lunch, you should make it a point of having a very healthy dinner. Like there's nothing wrong with eating unhealthy food occasionally. Like it's like the, doesn't say balance, it said not balance before. But it's all about balance, right? If, you, if you've had a massive night the night before and you know you're not going to be training the next day because you really shouldn't be training if you're super, super hungover, use that opportunity to have something that you maybe would consider a treat, pizza, McDonald's, burger joint, whatever it is. But then once you've had that meal, that's where it stops. You know, dinner doesn't become the same thing and then the next morning doesn't become a flow on from that. You, wanna, you sort of want to set yourself limits. So you, you don't want to restrict, but you also at least want to have like a level or, or somewhere to stop. Sorry. Um, similar. Um, what we do consistently is what shapes us, not what we do occasionally. So if you go and you have a big night and you consume food that you wouldn't normally eat, um, don't be guilty about it. I think the guilt factor that we put in ourselves, oh my God, we had a McDonald's or whatever it is that you had, then sort of like spirals out of control. So you just put a full stop at the end of that uh, sorry situation and move on to the next chapter, okay? It's, it's not a big deal. Once in a while, it doesn't really affect us. We're all humans first and we're trying to do our best in every situation that we can. So just having that one bad meal as you see it is, is not gonna affect what you've been doing in a, in a consistent um, manner for, for the rest of the time. And no food is bad. Every food has its place in our lives at a certain time. It's just if we overdo that consistently, and that means healthy food as well. So we can get too obsessed with having organic this, organic that, or just eating salads, or I'm only gonna have this all the time. That's becoming a huge problem in society now, getting too obsessed with clean eating. It's okay to have a burger or fries or a bit of, a bit of pizza once in a while. It's about changing it up. And also, if that made you feel happy, then that's also a win, okay? It's not just about how we're fueling our, ourselves with nutrition. Yes, of course, we need to give ourselves the right vitamins and minerals and all the rest of the good stuff that makes us uh, functioning people, but also a bit of joy when you bite into that nice piece of cheesy bread, this is me we're talking about, um, is also good for us as well, as long as we're not making that a consistent habit. 
Um, I think the, the key idea is actually all about sustainability. So oftentimes when you have a big night, then some women the following day or even some men decide that, oh, you know, just because I ate like 3,000 calories the day before, today I have to starve. Like, you know, I have to work out to burn off all the extra calories from yesterday. And to compound the effect, I can't, I can't eat like for the entire day so that, you know, I'm actually burning all the calories I ate the night before. And I think, um, it is not healthy because from a sustainability point of view, um, you know, if you're starving yourself, if you're only restricting yourself to either uh, chicken breast and, you know, boiled chicken breast and boiled broccoli from a sanity point of view, from an emotional and mental point of view, like it's gonna be very detrimental and difficult to sustain it throughout the rest of the year or like the years ahead. So often in January, people have all these new resolutions like, oh, I'm gonna eat clean, I'm gonna have a dry January as Mira pointed out earlier on. Um, and then you have a, a big night out, you know, someone's in town or it's a friend's birthday and then you feel terrible about yourself because you broke that New Year's resolution, right? And I think a lot of us can, um, you can relate to that because I definitely have been there at some point um, in the past. And I think it's the key thing is about sustainability. It is okay to have uh, waffles. It is okay to have um, ice cream, you know, every once in a while, like it's okay to have chocolate. Um, I personally don't think you should restrict your food groups. Um, from personal standpoint, a lot of people think I only eat salads for lunch and salads for dinner and, and maybe eggs for breakfast, but that's not true. Um, on the weekends, or even if you, you, know, you do come out for dinner or lunch with me, you do see I, I eat a lot of barbecue. Um, I do indulge in truffle fries. Uh, so I think it's a lot about sustainability, and if that keeps you sane, um, that, help, that helps you keep going. You, know? um, you can make healthy choices at some meals, um, but at other times, you can you know, afford to let yourself go a little bit, you know, indulge in, in whatever makes you happy. So we talked a bit about like clean eating. Um, I'm not really sure, but like, does detox really work? You know, uh, but I read so much Let's about go. it. So like, tell me Wait, more about it. Has anyone, I know one person here who uses a detox tea. I've seen her using it, but um, is there anyone who's done the detox tea or like that juice cleanse? Yeah. Yeah. It, it ain't fun, is it? You got real hungry. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> Um, I think the theme's been quite common as we say it's like a sustained effort so detox so your body has this setting it's like homeostasis it's when it maintains a level you know acidity in your stomach for those people who like the alkaline things and blood pressure and a temperature that's your body at its optimal and everything you put in your body it uses or mitigates so that you remain there you don't just drink it cup of tea one day and it's all, all of a sudden you're absolved of all of the bad things you've ever done. So, short answer. Um, there's a lot of fads out there. The bottom line is in health and fitness, people want to make money as well as in um, selling foods too. So, you know, we've got, you've got the marketing for various food companies that make things sound wonderful and healthy and it's not true. And the same is, is, is um, we can see the same thing about the health and fitness companies as well, right? So there's always a fad. I believe in just keeping it real and um, one step at a time. I'm the realistic nutritionist. I had a damp January rather than a dry January. Um, so you, you have to be real to yourself. We do a program called Clean and Lean. I'm not trying to plug it. I'm just, this is uh, pertinent to what I'm about to say. People come off sugar. It's not the detox that's causing them discomfort. It's the coming off the dependency of that particular product if they're over consuming it. Nothing is bad in moderation, but when you, you over consume it, your body becomes dependent on it. And, and coming off of that dependency is, is what's the, the brutal part. We never fully detox and, and neither should we. It can be quite dangerous, actually. We do need some toxins in there to be human beings. And um, they're attacking us from everywhere. So we really can't do it. I'm not a massive fan Sorry if anybody has a business doing this of uh, juice cleanses, um, because I think you're actually putting in a, a very high amount of sugar into your body. But more importantly, the nutritional value of the juice is, is pretty much been oxidized by the time that you consume it. Unless you made it and drank it on the spot, a lot of the benefits of that juice, vitamins and minerals, to be quite frank, 
no longer exist by the time you consume it. Um, and so it, it's sort of a placebo effect. Now, that makes you feel good. There's nothing wrong with a placebo effect, but just, just know what you're, you're, actually, you're actually doing. If you just try and, and eat reasonably and moderately, consistently, that's a lot of big words there, um, then you'll see the, 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 the health benefits rather than just trying to do um, a, a short faddy thing for a, a short period of time, which is probably not going to make you feel that great. I just have one thing to say about like juice cleanses. They taste pretty nasty. So I have gone, <laughs> personal experience, I have taken a juice cleanse for three days. It was not fun. I mean, it was bottles upon bottles. I think I had eight bottles per day, um, different colored bottles. You may start with a relatively fairly nice tasting, maybe it's an orange or a lime. And then there are some bottles that are just pure vegetable, just all green. And it was a struggle to finish it. And how they often tell you is, you know, you have to drink only the juices for three days straight and you would lose weight, right? It's supposed to help with detox, it's supposed to help you clean out your insides and then you're supposed to come out from the whole juice cleanse lighter and supposedly happier and you're all ready to start like your new New Year's resolution with like a healthy diet, etc. Um, I guess the point here I'm trying to make is when I went on the juice cleanse, it was not fun. And I think a lot of the so-called weight that you were losing over the three days was just because you were starving yourself. I mean, as, as Wendy said, it's very little nutritional content in a, a green juice. There's maybe barely any calories in a green juice because even if you look at vegetables, which um, the, the juices are made from, they barely contain any calories. So literally throughout the entire day, the only calories you're, contain, you're drinking is maybe less than 100, and most from the nut milks or, or whatever else, the sugars that are inside. Um, yeah, so I really don't believe in a juice cleanse. <laughs> um, so, I mean, just in terms of the, the whole macros thing, I generally don't understand it. Um, I'm at 30. I think, what, how, I think I'm 33, yeah, 33 or 34, I can't remember, sorry. Um, I generally, I'm not going to try, but what I do use is my fitness pal, because I think it's really great, because actually more than anything, it actually forces me to drink water, because Alicia and I work together, this is a really bad thing, but Alicia's already smiling. So one of the things that was my goal for this month was to cut down my Diet Coke intake, because it's actually real bad. I, have, I used to have like three or four cans a day, because I don't drink coffee, all right? So there's a thing. But anyway, moving on. But yeah, so I was like, that was the goal for this month. But I think one of the things that actually comes across with everything that all of you are saying is we need to find structure when it comes to maintaining balance. Um, when it comes to making sure you get the results, be it from a wearable or you know going to the gym and seeing your weight drop. Um, so with Luciano, you. F45, I actually really enjoy F45 because it gives me structure. So I'm in there with Nat most mornings um, at six. And the reason why I like doing the six o'clock is because it forces me to go to bed late instead of sitting out on Club Street and having an Aperol spritz till like midnight, which is really easy and also eating really bad food. But now with, in terms of structure, how important is that when it comes to fitness? And then also I'll then turn it over to John when it comes to the insights that you get from tracking it. How do you how do you think that people would be able to get the data back from what they're doing when they're at F45 class or any gym class for that matter? And how important is structure in your gym sessions as well as nutrition to move you forward? Um, I guess you know if you're looking at structure, what you're essentially looking at is um, planning. Structure structure is just planning later down the track so if you want to be successful and have a successful training regime or you want to have a successful meal plan it all starts at the very beginning when you decide what you're going to do what your objectives are and then what you're going to do to meet those objectives so with your training regimen if you decided you want to lose weight so you design your training regimen around that you would plan out which days you're going to attend and how long you're going to be there or what exercises you're going to do. All of this would be written out at the beginning. The reason is, is because if you just went in and you just winged it, chances are you're probably not going to do a full program or something that would be beneficial. You're also going to not do, every, uh, you're not going to do everything to the fullest extent. But 
the good thing about having everything planned and written down and decided for when you're not tired or fatigued or just don't feel like it is you can just give up and surrender to what you've written down and do exactly that. Because when you have a tendency to do it on the fly, you make allowances for yourself to not do what you planned. Whereas when you plan it and it's structured and you know you're going three days a week, every week for the next three months and you know exactly what you're going to be doing every time you walk into that gym, it's very hard to make excuses as to why you shouldn't do it because you've written it down, you've done this to meet your objectives. So when it comes time to do it, you just have to think, well, this is what I was planning for. All I have to do is do that. And then it's, it's a lot easier to achieve than if you're just making it up on the fly. So, <clears throat> so Fitbit does um, two things. We, we make trackers and we make um, smartwatches. And they you know, fundamentally track your activity. Um, one thing that Fitbit also does is create a lot of PowerPoint. And I, I remember seeing a presentation that our, our CEO, the guy that founded the company 11, year, 11 years ago, uh, gave at one point, and it, and it had a picture of three machines on the slide. Uh, a picture of a plane, a picture of uh, a car, and a picture of a human being. And he talked about the number of sensors in a car. There are literally dozens of sensors in a car, and the number of sensors in a plane, there are literally thousands of sensors in a plane that are tracking every single thing that that plane is doing. You know, you wouldn't get in a plane, uh, you know, if you were not 100% convinced it was, um, you know, it was going to be able to fly. Uh, human, there are no sensors. So basically, we are the most complex machine, and yet we, we really don't have a way, or before trackers came along, there wasn't really a way to track our heart rate, to track our sleep, to track our activity, to track you know, a whole bunch of other things. And they're becoming more and more sophisticated. So this one on my wrist is capable of tracking sleep apnea. Now, sleep apnea is a hideous disease. Uh, you know, people basically stop breathing during the night and, and really the, it's not curable and really the only treatment is a, a very invasive, um, you know, oxygen mask. Uh, it, it tracks atrial fibrillation. So they're getting smarter and smarter. They're tracking more and more. Um, the biggest trends in healthcare are prevention and personalization. So, you know, there's been a fundamental shift in the way that, um, you know, basically everybody is looking at medicine. You know, a, a little while ago it was about, I'm sick, I go to the doctors, and, and that's basically what we did. You know, when we were growing up, uh, you know, or you're not sick, go back to bed, you know. The, the whole premise for healthcare is changing, and it's, it's really being driven by two things. It's, it's fundamentally being driven by the fact that healthcare costs are spiralling out of control. Um, you know, governments, companies, that organisations that provide healthcare just simply cannot afford to keep funding the way it's going. So governments are looking at prevention. Uh, the second aspect is, and it relates to everything we've talked about, um, you know, there is an explosion of chronic diseases. So the government in Singapore has, has declared war on diabetes. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a very serious issue in this country uh, with type 2 diabetes. Um, <clears throat> Malaysia has a, an even more chronic problem because of the diet and, you know, they're not from data that we see, they're not an active population. Um, there, are more di there are more type 2 diabetics in India th than there are in the rest of the world. Uh, and the, the, the government there believes that about 90% of people in India don't know that they have type 2 diabetes. So chronic, very serious issues <clears throat> that, that, you know, ultimately kill people. Um, we know from work that we've done that 80% of type 2 diabetes and 80% of heart disease and stroke is preventable if you, or reversible, if you take greater control of, of your life. And, and that's what it's all about. So I'm, you know, I work for Fitbit. Um, I, I probably wouldn't have bought one if I didn't work for Fitbit. But, you know, I'm fitter and healthier than I've ever been. And, it, and it's about, for me, what I want to get out of life. You know, I don't want to die of a heart attack, you know, when I'm in my late 50s or my early 60s. Uh, you know, I don't want to have a stroke, I don't want to get type 2 diabetes, you know, my, my niece has got it and she is in casualty almost every four or five weeks because she just cannot cope with managing the disease. But, you know, the, the message here is um, it's hard but it's also very easy and it depends on what you want, what you fundamentally want out of life. If you want to be fitter and healthier, you know, it's okay to go out and have a big binge and have a hangover so, you know, you can't get out of bed the next day and you need to have KFC. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you're getting balance in your life and you're being true to yourself. Um, you know, that's the most important thing. The easiest thing is to delude yourself into an outcome 
Um, it's also very easy to, to do the opposite. If you want to be in control of your life, if you want to be fit and healthy, there are plenty of ways to do that. And you know, we now have technology, these things, that make it easier than ever to understand you know, how you're tracking, how you're going, what you're achieving. You know, if you're getting into bed and the first thing you do is pick up your phone and you're sitting there looking at your phone for an hour, you really only have yourself to blame if you're not getting a good night's sleep. Uh, you know, if you're honest with yourself, if you're really focused on what you want to achieve, uh, you know, it, it actually can be quite easy if, if you are willing to do that. I think that's quite interesting. So um, Fitbit is allowing you to actually track you know, your fitness and your patterns and to actually help you build structure around it and you know, a structure that actually works for yourself. Um, Natalie, what, like, you, know, you work like a really, really busy job. So how do you actually find that structure and make it work for yourself? Okay, so um, with regard to structure, actually I find that it is much easier to keep yourself accountable if you have someone to keep yourself accountable to. So it could be a friend, it could be a parent, it could be your gym buddy. Um, so a couple of months ago, I actually attended a seminar from Thrive Global. So the seminar was, the content and the agenda for the whole seminar was similar to today. Uh, it was just about trying to help you find balance. It was trying to help you find um, your ability to do things that you want to do in your life. That's something that you want to change. Um, so a lot of people had things like, I want to be fitter, I want to go to the gym more, um, I, I want to eat healthier, I want to be healthier, I want to sleep more, I want to be able to be more social. Um, and what the seminar helped us do was to conceptualize that into something more tangible. So like if it's fitness related, it could be, I want to make sure I go to one extra gym class um, every week, or I want to make sure I get seven hours of sleep every night. Um, so my personal goal when I, when I went for that seminar was to get uh, a glass of, an extra glass of water every day, one extra glass of water. And what they taught us to do was basically you have a friend that you're accountable um, to on a daily basis. So we actually had, like, we set up a group chat. So you can actually do whichever way you want. Like, it's either a group chat if you have more people, or, you know, if you see the person on a daily basis at the gym, it could just be a quick check-in. Like, you know, did you follow up on, on whatever you said you were going to do? Um, and the thing about what they shared with us at Thrive Global was that you need to be able to do that for a month before that habit becomes uh, something that sticks. Like, you know, so when it was like drinking a, an extra glass of water, like I know it's not much, but for me, I don't, I sometimes forget to drink water and I don't drink enough. And I know for, that for a fact. Um, so that was something that it was, for me, it was a huge thing. And I was going to say, you know, every day I'm going to drink one extra glass of water. And in the morning when I wake up, like uh, when I get to the office, I check in with my colleague. So this was a, a colleague, but also a friend. Um, so I do tell her like, you know, hey, I, I had my glass of water. It could just be a cute, like a cute emoji, like of a glass of water. It doesn't have to be like, hey, I drank my glass of water, you know. Um, and I think a lot of other people had their own versions. It could be, I, like I mentioned, that you, know, you want to go to the gym, um, you want to eat one extra salad meal uh, a week. Um, for those people who had um, their goals under more of like the social bit, it could just be, you know, I'm going to meet one new friend per day. So I think in terms of structure, like with regard to wellness and fitness, it is possible and um, it's baby steps like that. You know, if you have a plan, um, it is not so easy to stick to your plan if it's just kept between or just kept to yourself. But if you have it um, accountable to someone else, you know, if you wake up in the morning and the person doesn't text you or you feel like you need to tell the person that, yes, you know, I achieved my goal for the day. Yeah, so. Um, so we're going to open it up to the floor for questions. Now, Fitbit have been ridiculously kind and are giving away two Fitbit verses tonight. Um, so that's one of those, is, is that the version that you've got on, right? It's a few out the audience. Okay. So, oh, it's the one that Nat's wearing as well, and it's at the back as well. So keeping in mind that um, we are opening it up to the floor for anyone with interesting questions or someone that makes an impact with John and Vicky specifically. <laughs> I'm just going to put on Vicky. Um, will be in the running to win one of these two verses. Um, I just wanted to kind of jump back really quickly to what all of these um, guys, um, all of them, all our panelists have been saying. Um, I, I've actually worked with each of them, at not them individually, but with their brands at different points. I've got a chronic condition and it's neuro-based, um, neuro 
So that means that I'm on steroid therapy and that takes a lot of medication. Um, and your food habits change, you get allergic to random things. So I le found out I'm allergic to gin, which um, that was like three years ago. I'm not an alcoholic. I just want to clarify that. Like I don't drink a lot, but it's just that like, you know, you find out these like random things, but I actually, um, you fit were the ones who helped me to get back walking. Um, Fitbit was the one I, when it comes to structure, if you're looking for something to set that goal every day, I cannot, like, I, I can't even explain to you what, what uh, a step, the step watching does, because I find that if I look at my watch at the end of the day and I've been like jumping in taxis or driving everywhere, I will literally walk home from Southbridge Tower at City Hall just to hit those steps. And by the time I get back, someone's like nodding furiously over there. You totally feel me, right? Yeah. Um, and with, I think with F45 and also with the communities that come from the gyms that you go to, you have the ability to meet people who are like-minded. And I think that one of the biggest things, and even when you're here tonight, that you have to do is, Everyone here has their own backstory. They've got their own goals, they have their own questions, and the only way you're gonna find other people who have those same goals as you is if you have a conversation with them. So if you go to the gym, if you go into you know, any one of these gyms, or get one of your Fitbits, or get on the Fitbit feed, have a conversation with these people because you'd be surprised at who you would meet along the way who might have the same goals as you. I just want to say, I met um, Mira for the first time in, in November, and she is a truly remarkable um, individual. And, you know, like, um, Mira is a, is a huge Fitbit fan and allowed me to share her story with my colleagues as part of a conference. And, you know, incredible story. Um, incredible, uh, you know, in, amazing person. One thing I wanted to talk about, and, you know, it, you have to sort of stop yourself every now and then. This is a workplace. This is an office. This is where people work. Um, you know, the way that the world has changed in the last 10, 15, 20 years is quite remarkable. And, you know, we talked about support before. Uh, I think it would be a surprise if every person who's in this room tonight doesn't work for an employer who is really focused on your wellness. So I work for Fitbit and I get flexible hours, I get an allowance each month to go to the gym, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Fitbit's just um, you know, launched this remarkable leave policy. Uh, you know, your employer is very focused on your wellness as well, and that's not, you know, that, that, that's a genuine focus because employers are, you know, really concerned about your work-life balance as well. You need to look into that. So if you're working 10, 12-hour days, you know, you need to think about that and you need to talk to your, you know, your, your people at work about how to structure your life in a better way. I just want to make that point because, you know, we're sitting here in this incredible room, which is an office, you know. It's not like, you know, where I started working was rows of, you know, beige cubicles. That's, uh, that's what an office used to be and employers that didn't really care about, uh, you know, what you did or how you worked or how many hours you worked. The world has changed in a, in a really positive way and it's important to understand that. Do we have any Oh, there we go. Hands up. Wow. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sophie. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm an avid F45er and I'm also an avid Fitbit user. Um, I just have some feedback to Fitbit. It would be really wonderful if you could enable us to track F45 more accurately on Fitbit. Okay. <laughs> I will take that on board. <laughs> That's a good question. I, John, I've written into Fitbit. I've yeah. had no response. I so will, um, this, this is my opportunity to say to you, please, I will talk please, to Luciano please put it after on this. your agenda. I will, make, I will, it, make it a topic of discussion. Absolutely talk to Luciano after this. No worries. And, um, and we will look into it. Uh, right. you know, the, the device All of the people in this room will hold you accountable. Okay. All of the Fitbit people. <laughs> Does anyone else have a Fitbit? How do you guys track it? Interval training session or <laughs> workout? I know, 387 calories it says we track, but I believe it's more. Right. So <laughs> thank you very much well, for listening to I me. I think that's a good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's just a piece of advice. Thank you yeah. very much. Well, thank you for that. There wouldn't be, uh, you know, a Fitbit employee, employee if you were not permanent customer service wherever you went, whenever you went. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Um, okay, see where this goes. But um, um, I just moved here a couple of weeks ago, but I used to live here when I was younger. So it's been incredible from what you've said, how to 
watch actually how far the fitness industry has come from being here 12 years ago to coming back here now. I mean, there was just none of this. Um, and I've been working in the UK for a women's only health and wellbeing club for the last um, three years. And it's been really interesting seeing the fads and the trends as you talk about. But some of the interesting things that, because um, we had a whole medical clinic as part of the club as well. Um, and it was actually getting people, like you said, to actually get into fitness and actually shock people, I guess, in a way to actually say this is your health. And it's not just through eating and exercise, but through sleep deprivation, um, people that are working longer hours nowadays, women that are juggling things. And that's why we created that space there. But we used to, um, well, our medical team used to have something called telomere testing, and we also used to do something called DNA fit testing. And the telomere testing, which I'm sure you know about all of these things, but um, is a blood test that tells, I guess, ultimately your chronological age to your biological age. And I did it, and, my, and our CEO did it. And mine actually came back younger, which was shocking because I don't do that much exercise. Um, and I eat mediocrely, and hers um, came back. I think she, her body was five or six years older than um, her actual age, which shocked her unbelievably into, um, and for her it was, she was getting five hours of sleep a night, and she was stressed. Um, you know, she'd built this business from scratch. And the DNA fit test um, that was doing, that was kind of what I think you were talking about, Luciano, and how everybody's different, what you eat, what, you know, fitness you do is different. Um, and it tells you kind of what fitness and nutrition you should eat for your body based on your DNA test. I'd just be interested to know how that's kind of progressing here in Singapore over the last few years and what you kind of think of those kind of yeah. tests, um, I guess, because in the UK, we were well, at our club that I was at before, um, that really did bring a lot of people into suddenly shocking them, I guess, into yeah. coming actually doing exercise and doing something about their health and balance overall. Yeah. Um, nutrigenomics has been around for a long time, so that's the DNA fit test. Um, but it used to be very, very expensive, usually only sports people did it. And basically, in short, um, healthy food is not healthy for everybody, as in, you know, like a um, little story about me, sweet potato makes me fart. So, but it's great for lots of you in this room, right? So, but these tests will specify um, that carbs are maybe better for you, you should stay off the protein, not so much, blah, blah, blah. So it could flip on its head what you think is good nutrition in general and give you a specific as well. It's also, you might think you're a great runner, but actually you'd be better lifting weights and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So it, it doesn't need to define what you actually do, but it definitely puts you in the, the right direction. Uh, with the telomere tests about your, your age, it's, that's a great one um, in the respect that I think people just think health is what you eat and how much you work out. And it's way more multifaceted than that. So it's what you eat, it's how much you work out, it's your stress levels, it's how much you sleep, and it's your hormone balance. And a lot of people can do two, but they don't very seldom get the five. Um, so sometimes that shock factor will make them reassess what's actually important. So by that, maybe getting up at 5.30 to go do your workout class, whatever that might be, maybe isn't beneficial to you. Maybe you need to actually have an extra hour's sleep and just get a good walk in at lunchtime. That might actually be more beneficial for your health rather than, than actually caning it at the, at the gym every single day. Um, blood tests are super important, particularly for ladies. I mean, for men as well. Um, but it gives us a lot of our hormone factors. So thyroid, for instance, is, is, a, is a big one. But also things like our iron levels. Um, one in three women are deficient in iron. Um, it's very, very common, um, sorry guys, but because of our menses and, and having kids. And that really affects our ability to lose weight, it affects our ability to build muscle, it affects our mental health hugely. Um, and it's just, so just having um, certain criteria on paper can, can make you more focused on where you should be putting your energy into, because you might be focusing your energy into the, into the wrong thing. Hi, hi, I'm Zelda. So on sleep, I'm just curious on what's exactly good sleep. Does napping help and does it contribute? My dad's type 2 diabetes. I see he's not working and I know how, how chronic it can be. Um, so sleep, I see him sleeping half the day, but he sleeps again at night. So I want to know what exactly, does, it, um, does naps amount to so bad sleep or good sleep? Um, 
I'll, I'll just answer a little bit and then I'll give. Um, so napping shouldn't really be more than 20 minutes at a time. So people say, oh, I had a great nap this afternoon. It was two hours. It's, too, it's actually too long and it can affect your, your night sleep. So the sleep that you have at night is actually better. And although we're talking about sleep deprivation predominantly here, too much sleep also can be too bad. For, it can be bad for you as well. So they don't really recommend for adults to have more than 11 hours consistently. Um, so around about that eight-hour mark is, is pretty good. Um, but naps under 20, 20 minutes or under can be beneficial, but anything longer than that will affect the quality of your sleep through the night. So in short, if your dad's sleeping half the day, then that's not really a great thing for your dad. Um, so with, with sleep, I guess you, the minimum that you're sort of looking to get at any night is at least seven and a half hours, anything less than that, and you're cheating yourself out of some aspect of your health. So if you are going to skip sleep and on the topic of naps, um, say for example you only manage to get six, six hours of sleep, sleep cycles typically run in 90 minute intervals, so between REM and deep sleep. And, so if you, can, if you only, say, achieve four of those in a night because you only sleep six hours, if you can, and this is probably not applicable to anyone here, but if you can sleep for an hour and a half in the day, it's better to have an hour and a half sleep than a 20-minute sleep because you're getting that fifth cycle. So probably not that applicable, though. <coughs> I, I can't sleep during the day. If I have a nap... Um, and like it's almost impossible for me to go to sleep during the day. I, you know, I, I talked about the number of flights that I've had. I cannot sleep on a plane. I, I pass out. I literally, you know, my head drops down. So sleep during the day does not come easily to me. So napping is, is not a solution. Um, you know, I think your father is definitely sleeping too much and I hope, you know, he's obviously, um, you know, getting um, medical treatment. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's the duration and it's the quality of sleep. And we don't know that. You go to sleep and you wake up in the morning if you're not tracking it and you really have no idea. You know, you might think I was asleep, but you're actually awake or you were awake and you were asleep. You know, that, that sensation. I think being able to track it and, you know, the amount of data that a company like Fitbit has around sleep, uh, we, we now we now know what is a, you know, what is a desired amount. And, and the reality is... Um, you know, Asian people need less sleep than Caucasian people, probably by uh, maybe about 30 minutes. Uh, you know, and that, that's born out of data that came out of a study that we did with um, Duke and US here. Uh, you, you know, the thing is, um, most people who have sleep apnea don't know unless they go and do a sleep apnea test. Uh, so the benefit of tracking and measuring and understanding uh, is, is critical. Um, you know, sleep tests are very expensive. Strapping on a wearable and, and monitoring your sleep is actually very easy and, and they're very accurate as well, uh, which, which is a good outcome. And, you know, as I said before, sleep, the, the, the quality of your sleep is becoming more and more critical to the management of chronic conditions. Uh, you know, as I said before, we talk about type 2 diabetes. Most people think it, you know, is wholly related to activity and diet. But sleep forms a huge part of, of your ability to, you know, to defeat a condition like um, type 2 diabetes. Totally randomly, just before we go on to the questions, um, my dad had the same thing where he was just sleeping a lot. And I promise I am not plugging Fitbit. But um, I actually got him the, fit, like a, the, like the ARIA, I think it was called back then, just so to track his steps. Because if I called him in the afternoon and said to him, hey, what are you doing? He'll tell me that he's like been busy reading the newspaper and talking to his friends. He's not, he's sleeping. Um, and so what I used to do is that I would check at the, the following morning how many steps did he do. And if he didn't do enough steps, I'll go with him on Saturday and we'll go for a walk around the block like five times to like force him to do something. That's amazing. Oh, it's okay, you got a literally Asian, Asian dad's man, you just got to get in there and like just roll with it. All right, there was, okay, we will come back to you, but um, that person in the back, if you wanted to, did you want to just speak up from there, is that okay?
So I'm just um, data guy tonight. I can I can rattle off you know stats about anything. Um, it's a, look, it's a really a fantastic question. You know, I have a Fitbit, and I still there, there are nights when I sleep very badly, and you know my mind's racing. I can't sleep. You know, I, I will take melatonin, which makes me pass out. Um, we did a study in the U.S. Uh, you know, last year Fitbit launched um, a mood logging app for the two smartwatches, uh, the Versa and Ionic. Uh, and what, what we found, and, and there are, there's been a number of studies, but this is one of the most significant studies that's been done. Fitbit's published a white paper. And, and what we've determined is that there is a direct correlation between activity and mood. So this is self-logging. You know, it was not giving people a questionnaire to fill out. It was basically, are you sad, okay, or happy? Uh, and, and what we did was a direct correlation between how people were logging their moods and how much activity they were doing. Uh, and people who are happy were doing more steps. So, you know, it's a, it's a fairly simple equation. Uh, and it's not necessarily steps. It could be uh, a workout. It could be, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, swimming if that works for you. Um, you know, again, it, it's, it sounds like an easy solution. But, you know, life is difficult. And life is getting harder and harder. You know, the, you know, the advent of social media, the advent of, you know, devices uh, has, has really changed the way that we live our lives. And... You know, it, it, it is very difficult. It's hard to kind of put it down and walk away from it. But, but I think, um, you know, mental well-being is far more important than we all think. Uh, you know, I think the ability to relax an active mind is critical. And, and I've learned that, you know, and I've, I've got access to a whole bunch of data. You know, I've got, uh, you know, I I'm pretty much manage everything. But if I'm not sleeping, I know it's because I haven't turned my mind off. And, you know, despite me, you know, lecturing before about devices, my phone sits there. And if I can't sleep, the first thing I do is pick it up. And I'll pick it up and I know it's like having KFC. I know it's bad. I shouldn't do it. But I can't help myself. And I sit there and go on Twitter. Um, you know, it's not a good solution. But, you know, the ability to calm your mind uh, and to manage your activity, uh, uh, there is a, you know, there's a direct correlation. Um, I'm going to take this from a slightly different perspective. Um, you can't escape stress, right? It's, it's going to follow around wherever you go. So it's how you um, deal with that and, 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 and how you mitigate around your life with stress. So there's a few things that I find with myself and my clients that help. Um, our second brain is our gut. So if you eat healthy, your brain will feel healthier. Um, we've been talking a lot about type 2 diabetes today, but they're actually recategorizing diabetes, and there are going to be three categories now. And the third one is Alzheimer's and dementia, and it stems from the same way that type 2 diabetes is created. So therefore, if your diet is, is not on point, it's not just affecting your physical as in your body, but it's also affecting your mental. So stripping back your, your, your nutrition and looking at what you're doing there. So coping mechanisms, have a glass of wine every night. You know, like I say, damp Jan here, I'm not against wine. I had one before I came up here. Um, but if you're using it constantly as a, a coping mechanism, it is, is going to create more problems. Um, there's lots of studies that show sleep helps with stress, but then, you know, it's that ever decreasing circles. If you're stressed, you're not going to sleep, blah, blah, blah. If you can't sleep, you get more stressed. So trying to really get that sleep hygiene into place so that your sleeping becomes more productive. Getting out into the sun between the first two hours of sunshine in the morning. So luckily, if you live in Singapore, it's between seven and nine. If you live in Scotland, you have to get up at like three in the morning in the summer and get out there. Or just come home from the nightclub at three and you kind of solve the problem. But that first two hours of sun is critical for sparking things in our brain that I don't understand. I'm not going to pretend to because I'm not a psychologist. But it really does work, not just with our mental health, but with our sleeping. Um, we've got a hormone in our body called adenosine, which sort of like, it's like a timer. So when we wake up in the morning, it starts to accumulate and things like stress affects it. Things like drinking alcohol affects it. So it needs to, to reach a certain point that our serotonin and then our melatonin works to, to, to put us to sleep. One of the things that gets that ticking is the sunlight. Getting out and feeling nature. So lots of studies show that just taking off your shoes. What's the name of that film? The guy, uh, it's Richard Gear. Oh, Pretty Woman. And they have, yeah, she has him walking around with his feet. It's true though, right? I mean, I know it's like a corny film, but getting out and actually being amongst nature helps with stress. So just a few actual, just natural things really does help. Um, I guess tying it back to exercise, so you listed about 10 different things that make you stressed. 
So in the present day, we live in a state of perpetual stress. We've got deadlines, we like say relationships, you know, all these concerns financial and otherwise. Stress actually originated from a biological perspective of that thing's going to eat me or I need to eat that. So like the, the flow of events was that would happen and what your body would do is your digestive sh system would shut down. It's the most important part of your, I guess, your overall health. So when that shuts down, it basically only allows for the energy to flow to your brain, your lungs and your heart. So you can either catch or get away. So by following that, that feeling with exercise, it's kind of what your body was used to all those thousands of years ago or for thousands of years before we sort of evolved into our modern day us. So exercise is actually really well, is a really good way of managing stress. So if you, quite often when I feel like crap or something bad happens or something I particularly, that, that unsettles me, I will go run up and down a set of stairs for 20 minutes and after you've done that for 20 minutes you kind of think everything else isn't so bad and you can sort of see a way around it. So yeah, just using exercise for stress. Um, so I can share from personal experience. Uh, I have a lot of trouble sleeping and my fiance who's at the back of the room often hears this from me because I will lie in bed. I'm like, I can't sleep. Um, I could be lying in bed for half an hour, an hour. And then um, something that Wendy pointed out was uh, really resonated with me because, you know, if you're lying in bed and you know you have to be up in the morning at 5.30 or 6 or 7 to go to the gym or to the office, um, strangely but you get more stress because you can't get to sleep and then it's a vicious cycle because it's like i'm stressed i can't get to sleep but at the same time i know i have to get to sleep um and i have taken melatonin pills i have tried so, so melatonin um, is something that your body produces naturally which helps you fall asleep um but what they have in the market is they have melatonin and pills that can can simulate you know what your body produces naturally and then um, that's supposed to help you go to bed um, I've also tried like, you know, having essential oils in my room. I have tried turning off, dimming the lights before I head to bed. And I think it's just some of these little things that you can do, um, creating a routine for yourself and creating an environment that is a little bit more um, conducive for you to fall asleep. Um, it's very hard to escape from like work stresses. So for myself, I do know that sometimes, you know, you have a giant presentation that you have to do um, to your boss or you're thinking about the, that 5 p.m. meeting that you have tomorrow or, you know, you have to meet a client the following day. Like, it's, it's never ending and it could be work or it could be even just family commitments, etc. And it, it just adds up and it's not very healthy when, it, when you're trying to get to bed and rest is very, very important. Um, so I'm still learning, I'm still trying, I'm still trying to figure out like, you know, what works best for me and I think maybe, I guess the, my piece of advice would just be to figure out what works for you. Like, you know, it could be a warm glass of milk, like, you know, just something familiar. Some people, you know, when you grow up, like your mom or your dad would pour you a glass of milk if that's familiar and that helps you fall asleep or maybe it's a warm shower, uh, maybe it's um, getting, I don't know, like for ladies, maybe a face mask. Um, I try and avoid screen time. I, I know it's so it's strange because like sometimes before I go to bed, I do want to de-stress and I find that the best mode of de-stressing is literally just scrolling on Facebook or Instagram and it's, it's strange because, or, or Netflix, yeah, that's my weakness. So I lie in bed watching um, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I'm, I'm watching The Taste and if you're watching a food show, trust me, it's very, <laughs> it's very tough to fall asleep. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think I, I have tried to cut that out. I minimize screen time. I make sure that, you know, an hour before bed, I, I try and get into a routine that helps me sleep better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, more questions. Well, all right, so I think that was here first. Yeah. Okay, so we haven't talked about travel. I think a lot of people here have jobs where we need to travel. Uh, we have regional roles, sometimes global roles, where we have lots of calls in the evening. Um, so how do we manage sleep, health, exercise when we need to travel? I guess that's my question. Uh, so I, I travel a lot as well. And the, th the thing for me is, um, you know, usually when I get to the hotel, I go to the gym. Uh, it doesn't matter what time it is, I will go and do a workout um, and then I have room service and then I go to bed. 
and, and I sleep well. You know, that's my way of coping. Uh, the other thing I do, and, and I'm you know, trying not to be a walking billboard for Fitbit, Fitbit, but I actually walk a lot. You know, if I'm somewhere, if I, if I get there, even at you know, sort of one o'clock in the morning, if it's a safe city like Tokyo, I'll go for a walk. If it's Manila, I might not, but um, you know, walking and, and exercising uh, you know, is what keeps me sane when, when I'm traveling. Can we take uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, biggest tip when it comes to food when you're traveling is to be realistic with yourself. Um, you generally, if, you're, if you've got a global role and you're traveling around a lot, you'll probably stay at the same hotels predominantly. Breakfast is usually the easiest one to, to um, have control over. Um, oftentimes, hotels will make you a lunch to take with you to work if you're going to be stuck in the office and you don't have your usual telecare sun and moon around to get your, your salad or whatever it is. So don't be scared to ask the hotel to prep for you because if you're a regular customer, they'll happily do that for you as well. Um, as much as possible, if you you're, have client meetings, etc., at restaurants, try and have control of um, the place that you're going to meet and try and have a look on the internet before you go at the menu and make your choices of what you're going to eat before you get there so that you're not swayed by what other people are doing. Again, it all comes down to small wins and not being too harsh on yourself because you can, you can only control so many things in your circumstances. Hi there, my name is Laura. Um, so we've spoken about sleep, we've spoken about exercise, we've spoken about food. It was a fantastic question about our spiritual health. But one thing we haven't spoken about is supplements. And I'm in the food ingredients business and we've re recently just acquired a company, a probiotic company. I travel quite a lot, um, probably every two weeks, and I try to maintain everything. Um, but the marketing that's coming at me about um, the supplement business is obviously very loud. Um, it's actually forecast to be worth 280 billion by 2024, growing faster than the fitness industry. Yeah. Um, I don't like supplement. Oh, sorry. No. Sorry. Um, I've grown up taking multivitamins all my life. My mum has given me Pharmaton and a whole load of other things as well. Um, I'd love to just know what your opinion is on this particular industry and how you advise your clients. What time does this finish again? <laughs> um, I'm not a massive lover of supplements because um, most people don't know what they're doing with them. Most of them are not necessary. Um, I believe it was $490 million worth of supplements bought in Singapore last year. and Probably 450 million of those were just peed down the toilet because they were completely useless. With uh, multivitamins, you're not really getting the quality or the quantity of each vitamin that you actually need for it to be beneficial. Also, the way that nature has um, devised these things is very clever. Um, for instance, calcium is never just absorbed by its own. It always needs vitamin D and vitamin K alongside it. So if you're just taking a calcium supplement, you're probably going to get kidney stones, number one. But number two, it's not going to be absorbed because the other things you need there are not present. So you're just going to pee it out. When you drink milk, it has vitamin K, in, and though milk is not the best source of calcium either, but just using it as an example, it already has the, the other things that it needs there as well. The low-fat guidelines that we've been had for the last 40 years, um, predominantly people are not eating enough fat in their diet. So you've got your fat-soluble vitamins that are not going to be absorbed regardless to how much you eat um, because you don't have the fat present. When it comes to protein, you don't need anywhere near as much as you think you do unless you're going to be like a massive bodybuilder, in which case you might struggle. It's about 1.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. Um, women very seldom bulk up without doing a lot of other stuff. So you could be taking your protein shakes left, right and centre and you're probably peeing 90% of it out. As good as a, a meal supplement or to use to cook with, we've got loads of recipes that my great recipe designer Michelle over there, say hello to Michelle, um, uses um, proteins instead of like say for instance wheat etc. Um, so they, could, they can be good in, in that respect as well. With things like um, iron, there has to be lots of other things um, available at the same time for it to be absorbed. A lot of women don't have enough iron in their system because they just don't absorb it properly. So what's the point of taking a tablet instead of eating it in your food? You're not going to absorb it regardless. So you might need to have another intervention such as a, an infusion or something, for instance, as well. Lots of stuff that we eat and drink will block our nutrient. Uh, am I going on too long here? Yeah, it's okay. Will block our nutrient absorption. 
Um, so black tea, for instance, will block absorption of iron. So although technically speaking, when you look at um, vegetarian iron, you're getting enough from things like spinach, etc. It's not actually the bioavailable iron that our body likes. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, vegetarians, that does come predominantly from animal products, as in uh, meat. And if you're eating iron predominantly from vegetarian products, black tea will block any iron that you get from that vegetarian source. So it's completely useless. So that's why you have in places like India, etc., such high levels of iron deficiency. And this has got nothing to do with the question that you asked, but I just find it really interesting. I found this out not long ago myself. Uh, one of the main um, causes of maternal death through delivering a baby is iron deficiency. And in this day and age, and um, the solution is so simple, is quite abhorrent to me. I find that I was almost in tears when I found that out. I've got four kids myself. And to think that people are actually dying in huts in Africa, when it, it's a super simple solution to, to help those, those women. It, it's, it's not that expensive and it's not that difficult. Um, so I think supplements have their place. If prescribed properly, if used correctly, if you understand why you need them, if you've got all the other factors involved, but from what I see, they're not being used in the correct manner. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in probiotics, but you do need to cycle them. You don't need to take them all the time and your body gets used to them. So if you've had, if you've been really run down, you're really tired, you've been sick, you've had antibiotics, etc. Take probiotics, they'll definitely help. Again, um, your most bioavailable probiotics are found in your natural foods. So kimchi, sauerkraut, blah, 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 uh, fermented food in short. Um, magnesium is another one. Um, the way our farming is done now. So when I was a kid, I lived in a little city in, Aber in Scotland called Aberdeen. There was a farm at the end of my street. Um, they used to rotate the fields with different crops. They don't do that now. They just put one crop in and the soil doesn't produce all the, the minerals it used to do. So magnesium deficiency is, is super um, common. And uh, zinc. And that's about it, really. You don't need anything else. <laughs> All right. As much as you want to go through more questions, we're actually running way out of time. So if you do have more questions for our panelists, they're going to stick around, hopefully, for a little while more to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and John will let us know about whom he thinks would be a great fit, because I like to put it on other people. Um, so in addition to some of the um, two the folks that we have here. You would have seen on our event page, we've been having a couple of uh, promotions popping up. We told our, you know, some of our favorite gyms and community places that we go to, where um, the fact that we were having this event and they put up, put up some promos for us. So I know that some people had talked about wanting to get into boxing. Why is fantastic. Um, but Boom, which is on Cecil Street, is giving you $10 off your child pass. We Bar is um, at the back. Over there. Yeah. So, um, and we're gonna just before we wrap up, we'll um, ask her to just do a quick intro. And they have a booth over there. So, if you'd like to just sign up, I think it's a free trial for today, one one free class for today. And Vicky lives by it. She's obsessed with it. She won't stop talking about it. Um, ballet bodies. So, you've got Leisha at the back. She's one of the founders of ballet bodies. So, um, I got I personally got kicked out of ballet class um, because for. I, I, never mind. Um, so Ballet Body is another group that you can talk to, and they've got a promotion on as well at the moment, and so you can talk to them. F45, Luciano's team, who runs Amoy Street, Sigla, River Valley, Chumbaru, are doing a two-week free pass, um, which you generally have to pay for each week. So go on to the link. It's on our event page. You'll be able to sign up there. And Fitbit is... You've got some devices around the back as well? So, yep. Items got, um, 20 off. So 20% off Fitbit devices, or you might yeah. be the two lucky people that win one because you, had, you sounded really interesting to the Fitbit folks. But um, yeah, so that's it. Just to quickly just wrap up, that's Virginie. 
She is our Who's Your Mama program director. And Who's Your Mama is a mentorship program for anyone who's looking for any guidance when it comes to work, career, um, in terms of, you know, even if, I think the, one of the ones that we had last year was a girl in Balikpapan who um, was a graphic designer, but her parents didn't approve of her being a graphic designer, so we actually tried to get her a job in Jakarta, and we're moving her across to see, so that she'll be able to you know, get something that's more in line with what she loves. So we are looking for mentors, we're looking for mentees. Apparently someone's already signed up as a mentee, so thank you so much, but you can hit up our, web, our site for more details as well. And then Vicky is just quickly gonna talk about IWD. Yeah, as you know, um, International Women's Day is coming up in March and we'll be doing our first ever She Says Festival uh, where we have very, very exciting partners. But this year, um, the tagline is Balance for Better. So how can we actually achieve balance and create a better world? And essentially what we're going to be doing is having like workshops and talks around it, finding out how we can actually achieve, let's say, work-life balance to even equal work opportunities, um, and also closing that gender pay gap. How can we actually achieve equal pay too? Um, so we actually have a kind of a cute little social media campaign that we'll be launching very soon, which is around the women that actually inspire you. And you can hear a lot more about this, especially since you've signed up for today. So if you've came in without signing up with our welcome committee, definitely drop us a note or drop us your name card uh, so that we can let you know about this event that will be coming up in March. Um, so we're really, really excited about this um, and hope to see you there. So before we end, um, I just want to share a bit about my personal journey with finding the right balance also. Uh, so Mira has been a big advocate of health and fitness, and especially just now you share it with, you know, the, the health stuff that you've gone through, right? Um, but I think essentially finding your own balance is to find happiness, which is what I got out of, you know, the talk today. Um, I'm not the most fit person. I still like my vices, um, booze, unfortunately. But, you know, it's really <laughs> about finding that right balance for you, finding that structure and, um, you know, and finding out um, the, the, the community and the friendship that you can find to actually help you achieve that. And I felt like actually since last year, I really got into that structure. And part of that was also because um, I found a workout that actually worked for me. Um, it's not work, waking up at 5.30 a.m. But, you know, it's, I, I realized actually I kind of like ballet, yoga, pilates, which is actually bar. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we could get Joey to come on stage to just talk a bit about WeBar because uh, she's got a little booth over there. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name is Joey and I'm from Weba. Hi, Leisha. Hi. Hi, guys. Oh, my God. There's so many people. And this is more people than I'm used to. A bar class, we usually have about 8 to 15. And wow. All right. Anyway, I'm from Weebar. Weebar is um, lead Asia's leading boutique bar studio. We are specialized in everything bar. So high impact bar, low impact bar, stretch and technique floor bar. We have it all, prenatal bars, well, postnatal, we can bring our babies along, babies at the bar. All right, anyway, we have four studios here in Singapore and one in Hong Kong. We, we started about three years ago. We, our workout combines ballet technique, Pilates, and strength training. Um, we have two kinds of, we have several class types. The more popular ones is our signature multi-level, which is cardio-based, and our fundamentals, which is alignment for the total body burn. But more than a workout, we really provide a community and we try to empower each other to be your strongest and happiest self. Yeah, and in fact, um, actually the, there's a promotion around the birthday. Um. Oh yeah, right. Right now we're having a birthday promotion, so it's 15% off all our class packs. Woo! Yeah. And also, if you want to RSVP for our free class happening on the 11th of February after Chinese New Year, mm -hmm. Right, you can come down to the booth and sign up for it. Thank you. Thanks. And just, um, just before we finish up, uh, we're going to give away four Fitbits tonight. And the reason I'm going to do it, your question about mindfulness was brilliant. So if you want to go down, my colleagues, uh, WT and Mabel, are down there. They will give you a Fitbit Versa. Um, the lady who was brave enough to ask me a customer service question, I think, deserves a, um, yes! a Fitbit. So you may go down and pick a device. And your, your friend, um, I'd like you to take one for your father. Um, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, to help you understand what's going on with him, because clearly, you know, that's an issue and you, you thought about asking me the question. And then I'm going to ask my panel, fellow panellists, to decide who the fourth one should be. I think there were some good questions down here. Any, any ideas? Who else asked a question? Hands up.
<laughs> okay. One lady. Yeah. All right. Down go. the back. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, thank you, John. Um, so just to kind of wrap it up now, I know that we're running way over time, but in February, we're going to be having a follow up to tonight's session um, with our venue partner, Monte Carlo Boys. Um, we will hopefully have some of the folks from this panel there, um, there but we'll also have Karen Neo, who's a fitness blogger, as well as um, she runs the F45 Challenge, who'll be speaking in addition to Nat and a couple of other folks. So if you'd like to have more conversations with them and you can't stick around tonight, February 20th at 6 p.m. is the date, and we'll have it up and running, and tickets will run out. I know that this one ran out in two days, and some people got tickets later on, but um, hopefully we'll see you on February 20th. And other than that, we'll see you at our next session, and thanks for sticking around. We hope you found it as fun as we did, and thank you to our panelists.